Hello, everybody. This is the CUDA and Open Lab Seminar, Cultural Data Analytics, uh, on March 4, 2024, from Tallinn, Estonia, and today, Alicante, Spain, uh, where we have Almudena Nolasco Tsirugeda, who is an associate professor for urban design and urban planning. Um, and she works uh, with her group a lot on um, sort of social media and cities and trying to make sense of the patterns and dynamics that we all occupy in places we call cities. And so I will just give the stage to you. As usual, we have a two hour time slot. Um, the standard with lectures is sort of 40 minutes lecture, uh, 80 minutes discussion, but uh, you can do whatever you want and you can take questions in between. Yeah, we can drift off, we can um, end early, or uh, the only thing we cannot do is like be longer. So um, yeah, we're very, very excited to have you and we're looking forward to uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for, for inviting me. I'm, I'm glad to be uh, sharing in the seminar our research. And I think that it's not only because of the opportunity of sharing our topic, as you said, I will try to describe it further during the presentation, but uh, not only about that, but uh, just for sharing our uh, common uh, interest, uh, I think, as I think like in data analytics, right? So uh, maybe I should share my presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. I think that you can see it now, right? Yes. Yes, thank you. So I have entitled the presentation Unveiling Social Functional City Activity Through Location-Based Social Network Data because uh, this is what we mainly have been doing during the last decade. Um, the presentation is structured um, uh, in three parts, more or less. Like uh, the first part is about like our first steps, how we um, got inspired uh, through uh, with this uh, data about cities to unveil uh, some different topics in the city. The second part is about the method, how we work with data, because it is true that, as I will show you, our team is uh, mainly um formed by uh, architects so we are not really um masters of data analytics or data mining and our aim or our interest is in using this data to plan and to intervene in the city so that's mainly the second part and then the third part is about like a collection of case studies that we have been uh, approaching by in with different types of data with different uh, interests and i just will i think i will finish with uh, what are we currently doing right mm -hmm. so um uh, just to begin um i think that it's sorry i think that's the last <laughs> okay now, <laughs> that's the beginning of the presentation, sorry. Um, first, I wanted just to uh, show you our team. Uh, Professor Pablo Martí is the lead of Mapping Game Group, which is a group in the based uh, in the University of Alicante. We are, uh, as I said, uh, all mainly architects, and uh, we have uh, work worked uh, with the other different groups and have been collaborating with some uh, students and invited researchers uh, that were as well interested um, in unveiling like the intangible layer of the city through uh, social network data, right? So um, as I said, the works that inspired us like one decade ago, one of the first ones that uh, spoke uh, in our minds was uh, this exhibition from uh, Sarah Williams when she was working at Columbia University. Uh, the exhibition we are here now uh, was like uh, a simple way of representing um, uh, data from Foursquare. 
I'm just briefly explaining what Foursquare is because, uh, I mean, some of you may be familiar or not, but Foursquare was a social network uh, where you could uh, check your presence in a place or in an establishment in the city. And um, it provided a lot of information um, of uh, where the people was in the city or what were the people doing. So um, we find it interesting because of that power that this social network had on letting us know uh, which were the most uh, visited places in the city, which were uh, the different types of interests that the people could have in spaces or activities. And with this kind of image, like an easy representation of the types of activities in colors and the amount of people visiting one place with that size of the circle, that could provide a lot of information of where, where in the city the places that were more, um, that generate more attraction, let's say, right? So Foursquare uh, was popular like one decade ago, then it uh, went uh, like with another name, uh, Swarm. And currently maybe it's like old fashioned or updated, but the um, location technology that Foursquare used uh, was like the best one in the market. And I, as, as far as I know, I think that it's the one that Apple is using or apps that everybody wears, uh, everybody has installed in their devices such as uh, Uber or uh, Spotify and among others, right? So Foursquare, um, I think it's no longer existing as that type of social network, but we are still uh, uh, feeding that data set with just uh, walking uh, through the city with one of that applications installed in our devices. Um, in line with this, uh, we were inspired by works that were updating through social media data uh, traditional methods of analyzing the city. For example, in this case, uh, that traditional analysis about perception of the image of the city by Kevin Lynch was like uh, remade and up updated with uh, Instagram data uh, by Junji Lee in 2015. So we started thinking of the, pos of the many possibilities of that type of data, the data in social media, uh, for uh, revealing or for helping us in our current work, right? Because, for example, we as architects uh, had like that part of analyzing and observing people behavior in the public space. And as William White in that uh, seminar work of social life of small urban spaces, um, we thought that um, the data in social networks could help us to know where people was, at what time, and what were they doing. So as uh, in these works, we started like playing with little data sets from different social networks. We, for example, started to um, work with Twitter because uh, metadata meta data in Twitter could tell us where people had posted a tweet. Well, I, I still keep saying Twitter, but I know I, I, I can't barely get used to <laughs> call it X, right? I will try, but all right, maybe I, I cannot, I cannot, I, I will not succeed during the presentation. So uh, it's great. Uh, sorry. It <laughs> that, that, that's a, that's a good uh, a, a good revenge on Elon taking away our social media. Just call really? it Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why he did that. I I cannot understand it. But well, I will try to uh, <laughs> call it X. <laughs> maybe for the most uh, the youngest uh, audience. Uh, well, uh, on a different scale, uh, we try to map the presence of people, right? I showed, right? This is a public scale, uh, space scale, and this is like the waterfront of Benidorm City, which is a city uh, near to Alicante, right? And mm -hmm. as well, we uh, were trying to um, work as in that we are here now um, a project 
but in a, at a small at smallest scale, right? This is again the water from in Benidorm with the different types of activities and with that two big blue circles that represent uh, the two main beaches uh, in the city, which is a touristic city, really well known among uh, some uh, international um, scope of tourists. And well, we started uh, realizing that this, this had a lot of potential, right? Uh, our first uh, projects were uh, really um, straightforward, right? We, we, as I said, we didn't really have uh, the tools or uh, knowledge on computation that could make us like work with uh, really big um, data sets. So we started just uh, revealing and trying to find out, for example, what, which were um, the most popular uh, public spaces in cities that we uh, re really, uh, I mean, cities that were really well known for us, right? So we found out that Foursquare was giving precisely that information and that maybe that uh, plazas, which are popularly known among um, people in the city, were easily acknowledged with that uh, information in social networks. So that that information is an evidence of what we can popularly know. But uh, with that data, we could demonstrate some facts of that, let's say, like popular knowledge in, in cities. Uh, we were really worried at the beginning about the validity of the data sets, right? Because uh, we always were aware that maybe not everything in the physical reality has its own reflection in that uh, virtual uh, world. But uh, working parallelly in a sense um, by making like field work and then like uh, checking what the data was to offer, uh, we um, realized that uh, even uh, the virtual data could give us more information than the one we could gather or collect by our common field work. For example, in this case, we checked um, like visiting this waterfront in Benidorm, the types of land uses and activities in a bunch of meters. I can't remember if it was like 150 meters long of that uh, waterfront. And then we uh, retrieved that data in uh, at that time, Google Places, now it's uh, Google Maps. Uh, and then we realized that uh, not only it gave us uh, the same amount of registers for food or more or less for stores uh, and the lodging, but as well, uh, Google could provide information uh, on land uses that are not only on the ground floor, but are on the upper floors of the buildings. So, of course, that was a, a reliable way of proceeding with uh, some um, of the of the topics that we are, were usually uh, working on with much uh, with less data, with uh, less uh, means, and and that was like like a boost uh, to our research. In terms of land uses, we started tackling with uh, calculations, uh, like simple calculations on density, on diversity, or on the Shannon index in different cities. Uh, and we had as well some concerns about the scale, uh, at which scale should we proceed to, to make the analysis, depending on the amount of data and the purpose of the study. So, Can you, uh, I, Mike has raised his hand. I surmise he will ask what, what you mean with Shannon Index and for how diversity is defined and stuff like that. Ah, okay. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes, please stop me because <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm, I'm. No, no, no. It's great. It's great. We just okay. uh, we're, we're naturally curious about these kind of concepts. So. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, density is in this case about the number of land uses of the number of activities that we do have in a determined area. In these cases, we were working with a one hundred per one hundred meters grid, and 
um, that was the purpose, like to ca just calculate the number of activities uh, in that area. Uh, the diversity is related to the variety of land uses, how many different types of land uses were found in that area. And the Shannon Index is as well about uh, the diversity and the uh, Shannon Index comes from the ecology and applied to cities is like analyzing the different types of uh, species, we could say. Uh, in a place. So uh, we were analyzing as well with this uh, formula the, the, the variety of uh, activities in the place. This was all in line because maybe I'm going straight forward to uh, the, the types of analysis or our uh, concerns, but this was related to the analysis of um, monofunctionality of, of uh, city areas or um that complexity uh, found in specific areas in the city because uh, in our context in alicante we have um tourist cities around us and our main problem is that we have uh like for example i don't know if you can see my uh, mouse yes yes for example in this city denia we have a uh, um, big areas of residential only residential uh, uses. So we were in line with uh, the discovery of this type of information that we, you know, we had that intuition, but uh, we needed like evidence to start analyzing and proposing, uh, which is the end of the story, right? But we, we wanted to, to make strategies to provide um, some, uh, ways of intervening in that areas of, of the city to provide more complexity, for example. So I am just like showing like pieces of work of our initial works that some of them are even not published. So if you're interested in, in some of, the, of, of these works, maybe I can provide uh, some more information about them. And uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Like sure. the the data you get from Google Places, I surmise, is their categorization, right? Because they, they already... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I will explain something of, about it further uh, later on, sorry. Okay. But... Uh, that, that's funky, right? You agree? <laughs> yeah. If I'm not, if I'm not um, specific, please let me know and I will try to make my best and explain it further. So, well, this is like the end of the inspiration, right? So at that time, uh, having worked a little with different types of data sets and social networks, we were convinced that, as you can see on the right, uh, the data from social networks could provide an image of the intangible layer of the city that would respond to the physical city itself, right? This is a map of the city of Madrid and half of it, the left figure on ground part is just showing the physical and tangible aspects of the city. And then the right part is um, made from data from, I, I think it was like Facebook places, uh, Google and uh, Foursquare. Mm -hmm. So it is astonishing how much the virtual reality talk about our cities. Um, nowadays. So at that time, the big questions were, we had like two big questions to solve because uh, we have like, uh, in the spur of a moment, we said, oh, we can get all the information that we want from the cities. We, um, I mean, where's the limit of all of this? And uh, the first question was, which type of user-generated content is useful to broaden our knowledge about human activity in cities? because not everything is useful or not everything, I mean, or we could not approach to every data set in the world, obviously. The thing is that nowadays we are used to um, that sense of we are always generating traces or digital traces of activity through uh, the use of, for example, credit cards or uh, the, I mean, sensors in the city or even CCTV. Um, cameras. We are leaving footprints everywhere we, we go. But the thing is that 
uh, what we were really interested in human activity, I mean, in the data that could provide us evidence on human activity. And at that time, we were not really into a lot of funding, let's say it that way. And we needed to uh, rely on free and open source uh, data. One decade ago, that what is it, and currently it's not that way, as uh, you may know. So from all the data sources, all that uh, media that was available and all that application programming interfaces that were open at that time, uh, we selected some because uh, they um, had or, or they offered data related to people's activities in cities and they offered geolocated data which was uh, registered through mobile devices because we were interested always in uh, a data which was linked to the physical reality. So after some reflection, we were focusing on the work with Google Places, Foursquare, Twitter X, uh, Wikiloc, Airbnb, Instagram, and Strava. Maybe I will, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but maybe with the different um, case studies, I will, I will explain it further. And the second question was, what can we find out about uh, city social functional dynamics, right? Because uh, one social media can let you know about the presence of people in one place and others can, for example, um, give you evidence about the image of the city or something different. So in general line, in general topics, uh, we think that we thought, and now we know, that Foursquare and Google Maps could provide information on urban economic activities and land uses, um, that we could know about the people's presence in, through uh, that data from Twitter, because it offers the geolocated and timestamp of uh, the tweet that you emit. Uh, in, up to 2015, we could count on Instagram as a reliable source, but it was and the API was closed and we couldn't have that information anymore. That's why it, it's in black and white tones. And we could know about uh, what uh, were the people interests on, over uh, urban places and spaces because Foursquare, Google Maps, uh, X, and at that time Instagram could offer uh, that amount of text that could be analyzed and then we could know um, Sorry, that's about the opinion. The text is about the people's opinion, but the interest um, relies uh, on the ranking and voting over places or um, if many people was present in a place at uh, one specific time. And finally, we were interested in um, some other uh, social media such as Airbnb, Strava, and Wikiloc, which are related to uh, running tracks or um, itineraries and trails register, we could uh, speak specifically about the tourism and other uses as sports or walking through the city and so on. So as I said before, our purpose was to contribute to urban planning and city design at different levels because uh, up to some few time, urban planning was made from always from top to bottom, right? Uh, we said that there's a citizen participation and something like that, but it is true that uh, with this evidence, speaking of the behavior of people in cities or the interests or the presence of people in cities, we can have an idea of the uh, bottom layer of uh, the users in cities just to um, leverage that information and, and use it for planning and intervention in the city, as I will show you uh, with the case studies. So briefly about the method, we had to develop a desktop application that could uh, retrieve um, information, as I said, from that APIs, that application programming interfaces. The, the, the software is uh, called SMUA, uh, Social Media Urban Analyzer, right? 
And once the data was retrieved, uh, we uh, started to fix like a methodological process for each of the networks. We were interested, of course, because I mean, from all the metadata uh, available of each of the medias, uh, we were specifically interested in the location, the latitude and longitude um, parameters of the information. If they had uh, temporal information, Twitter does, for example, as I said, with a timestamp of the of the tweet. Um, the different types of user generated information, in some cases, they are texts, photos, um, it is a ranking, it is, uh, um, uh, yeah, like the, the ranking or, or the number of stars you provide or you give to a place. Um, as well, it is interesting, the data categorization, as you, uh, uh, Max, were asking, uh, the classification on the land uses that, for example, Google Maps provides is interesting. But even with that, we need to reclassify all that information to get to know uh, what we need or to get to the problem itself that we want to analyze or, or, or that we want to provide evidence on. Uh, so, uh, and the end, uh, and I mean, the fifth element which is necessary for us is like the unique ID, right? So with that um, information, we had then a process of removing the duplicates, verifying the data, classifying the data, because it is, it is true that we think that all the data in social media is generated by users, but users are not always one person walking through the street. Sometimes it's a bot, sometimes it's a, a, a company um, like uh, emitting um, 100 tweets a day. So sometimes we had to work with the data and try to verify that there were no bias in, in that uh, data sets to have uh, like verified information for the matter. And as a result, we get to that, as I said, to that data mapping, to that reclassification, to that analysis, and overlapping the results we could get through uh, the dia diagnosis and the information about the social functional dynamics in cities. So uh, I don't know if I was specific enough, uh, Max, or maybe because I'm starting with the case studies. Yeah, maybe this is a good moment to like, maybe you go back one slide and uh, let's take questions. There's a lot of really interesting things that you mentioned. Okay. So I like this reclassification idea, like, you know, that this is sort of something that we all do, like cleaning up data, preparing data, whatever, but calling it reclassification is a really interesting one because it basically um, it very explicitly sort of adds this layer of authorship that you add something basically, which wasn't there before. And um, yeah, I don't know. Um, so this kind of thing, you have analysis, reclassification, mapping. So this is obviously something that you would sequence in a way, right? So the, the pipeline reclassification and, and mapping sort of precedes analysis while at the same time it also is analysis. And so, as you said, you, you are basically a group of architects uh, this is quite interesting because this has a very long tradition in architecture, hasn't it? So, so, so there, in some sense, I, I think we could learn a lot from that practice, basically. Is that something where you feel at home among architects or is there something you need to constantly repeat as completely new, basically? Well, I am, I am really, I mean, um, as far as I know, let's say, because uh, the architects, who um, in Spain, architecture is a degree that uh, covers not only uh, building sciences, but mm -hmm. also urban planning, right? Mm -hmm. So when we work with geolocated data, we usually work with uh, GIS softwares, and that has uh, facilitated a lot the task in spatial analysis and reclassification and, and mm -hmm. so forth. I would say that this is not really common between the architects that I know, because uh, there are rather different interests uh, 
in the city, even even when the interest is in the city, right? Because sometimes mm -hmm. the perspective is more on the physical reality or or on just building construction. But um, in our case, uh, as I said, um, we had to make a great effort, uh, as you said. I we need to. Um, keep uh, learning strategies, keep learning on uh, computing languages that are <laughs> really far away from our knowledge. But I think that the GIS softwares have made a long way through helping us in that reclassification, that mapping and, and so on. Um, our process of representation and working with this data uh, has been really uh, manual after beginning at the beginning mm -hmm. and as i said we have um that that part of the i mean when we started we could not uh approach a uh, two million uh registers that data set because it was we we could not uh approach that all that information but uh, nowadays it's easier to um, check it and we have made our own little applications just, just to, for example, as you asked before, with the Google Maps uh, subcategories. We start with 107 and nowadays we have millions, I would say, because it, as long as you can register your own company on Google Maps, um, the type of category that you can give is uh, almost unique. Uh, so uh, nowadays we try to um, reclassify with just predefined lists that we have been elaborating during this time. Just to, um, I, I, I was to say easily, it is not that easy, but it is like less, um, less hard than, than at, the, at the beginning, <laughs> let's say. Nice. One thing that comes to my mind here while looking at this picture is something that looks very unconspicuous, but the fact that you said uh, you work a lot with GIS software, you also started with Valencia, I think. And so, you know, there's like people need to be aware that, like, you know, this is sort of like open source culture of GIS software starts in Spain, basically, right, with Cubis. Uh, which is a really interesting moment in time that also happened sort of like slightly before you were um, beginning your kind of research. So there's one thing which, as I said, looks unconspicuous, but actually is deeply intertwined with this thing, which is this notion of overlapping of results. So if you have maps and then you overlap them, like basically you lay them on top of each other in a geographic map, and all of a sudden you can make these comparisons. And that is a really interesting thing because like, um, for comparison, we have just Miloeva and like basically most of the group here uh, have published um, a framework for new zero analysis, which is functionally cultural history, media history, film history. But uh, there, you know, it's still in 2024, you can run with the fundamental novelty that you have multiple results, one with different methods, and you sort of like have this multi layer or sort of like, you know, complementary approach. While in maps, we sort of naturally do this since basically since Noli and Piranesi did ancient buildings versus modern buildings in Rome, this is sort of like the natural thing we do with maps since 250 years. And so that is sort of something which um, which I would like to ask you, uh, is there something where you say, okay, uh, in one sense, this comes sort of natural also in the audience, while at the other hand, there's certain things we get stuck with because we're sort of stuck with the geographic paradigm. I mean, social networks don't lend themselves, for example, to be mapped in geographic space because, you know, all students meet in this building and there's almost nothing happening in the rest of the city. So, so how do you deal with that, with these kind of things? Well, I think it's it's, it's um, our reality is in what you said. Uh, working with maps is something that naturally comes from us, from our background and our formation as architects and urban planners. So when I speak of overlapping of, of results, 
um, what I am speaking about, it's that uh, overlapping of layers of information. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we have a layer with uh, trails and we have a layer with land uses and then we have a layer with presence of people and then we look at, at those layers and we find out things that it's like our natural way. And it is true, and I think the question is really interesting because it is true that currently uh, we are, or the culture is obsessed with um, modeling everything and find the models and the algorithms that let us know about something. And currently we are trying to work with algorithms just to let the algorithm tell if um, uh, it sees what we see in the city. And I think uh, there's beauty in doing that overlapping of results and the, then the cartographies and then finding out the space, the, the, the clustering or, or, the, um, or, or, or the relationship between or among that information. But it is true that algorithms are facilitating some issues in cities. But, we need, but at this moment of time, I think that we still need to be vigilant on that because it's not always true what uh, it comes out from that uh, models. I don't know if, I, <laughs> yes. if I'm answering more or less the question. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we should, I don't know if there's no hates race, so let's just go on. Thank you very much. This is okay. great. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, as I said, I, I will follow with some uh, cases. They are not presented chronologically because uh, I prefer to do like uh, some grouping uh, of topics. Um, the first topic is about tourism because it was one of the first uh, specific issues that we approached with that social media data. It is true that we live in a context where tourism is uh, a fundamental part of our um, activity and our reality of our cities. And in that case, for example, this is uh, the city center of Valencia and with uh, just, as I said at the be very beginning, just with a little data set of Foursquare and Google, we reclassified the land uses. We selected that uses that were related to tourism and then uh, some trails and some groupings of clusters of places started to, to appear. And as I said before, this was like to, um, we already knew uh, which were uh, the touristic places in Valencia, of course, but um, the, um, the novelty or, or the application of this type of research was that uh, we could know which were the touristic places in a city that you uh, never have been to or you don't really even know. So uh, in this case, as you can see in the image, we could have that uh, information of uh, that um, balls were showing up, the place, the most touristic places because they were the places where the most visits they have and the, and the land uses in relation to tourism uh, were clustered. Um, Building on this, uh, we were uh, attracted, let's say, by that of uh, the modeling and the algorithmics that I said before, and in collaboration to one visiting student from uh, Ion Minku University in Romania, we were working in Bucharest, not just to identify that tourist areas in the city of Bucharest, but uh, to characterize them, just to try to find out uh, how tourism in, in cities, I mean, in complex cities, were showing up or were having a form or influencing uh, the dynamics in cities. Here we use the local Morans uh, index to you know, find the uh, correlation among the points and the visit and the visitors and 
so on, and the outliers. So uh, the red dots uh, were the maximum correlation areas. And from that areas, we try to uh, find a pattern in two of them, because um, these tourist activity centers are characterized commonly for the concentration of monuments or cultural activities or historic uh, urban fabric or something like that. But mm, the, the, develop, the, the discovering here was that uh, not only there were like uh, touristic clusters in the city demonstrated by the activity in Foursquare, uh, one of the discoveries was that in this city, the cultural, uh, I mean, the tourist areas where uh, what you can walk around in 30 minutes at the most. Uh, all the land uses uh, based or linked to this tourist activity were in an area that you could simply walk at that time. And maybe this is, um, a pattern, we, we thought at the beginning that we will extend this uh, research to other cities and later we did not, but it, we could still do it. And maybe it's a pattern in many cities uh, in Europe uh, due to the distribution of land uses. Um, some other works uh, are related to, as I said, um, the opinions of people, or in this case, what we did was uh, trying to infer the types of land uses or activities of human activities uh, from the Twitter texts. At um, Well, we had like a data set of one year of information in the city of Valencia. And uh, as I said, we did not really have skills in computing. So we uh, get all that text and just uh, checked uh, after deleting like the determinants and like the um, some of the words, uh, we just tried to classify the 500 most, most repeated words uh, in uh, three groups. Uh, eating, shopping, and sightseeing, and see if the geolocation of that tweets containing that type of words uh, were responding to the activities in the city. And the thing is that it does. I mean, people's tweeting about what they are doing uh, in the cities, among all other things, as I said before, because they, there were some biases and there were some, uh, I could say, outliers in this case. But uh, with quite uh, a high accuracy, we could say that the places for eating, shopping, or sightseeing at the different times of the, of the day um, were accurate uh, in that case. Uh, more recently, we have been, as I said, um, analyzing the socio-functional dynamics. Uh, in this case, we were trying to, um, with the aim of uh, planning strategically, we were uh, unveiling if uh, those trails that officially sometimes the town halls or other institutions uh, say that are the, mo the touristic trails or the uh, well-being trails, if they were the trails that the population really use in their everyday lives. So maybe it's, um, can, we can check it better here. In blue, there are the trails that in Alicante, for example, the, um, the town hall says they are the most popular trails because they have a cultural impact or they are linking like precious uh, attractions. But in reality, using Wikiloc, uh, tracks, we see that in orange, population is, for example, more interested in walking along uh, the waterfront in all the dimension, or uh, that that buffer around all the trails can link most of the facilities and the and the land uses uh, that are relevant to population, such as like let's say. Uh, parks, green areas, hospitals, schools, cultural uh, spaces, 
and, and so on. So this is a way of recognizing that, uh, as I said before, that bottom-up planning can work much better than uh, we thought. And in line with this, we did as well this work, which was, um, our aim was just uh, try to reveal the social preferences over uh, the green urban areas. Um, because in the city of Valencia, uh, they had a green infrastructure planning, which is in the imaging greenish and brownish uh, areas, right? And they, um, recognize some of the elements uh, in that green infrastructure planning. But we thought that that type of planning should uh, incorporate all that green areas or relevant places in the city that are commonly uh, present in, the, in people's everyday lives. So we transposed like the um, landscape ecology theory with that uh, mosaic patches and and corridors to the three urban elements that we thought that could represent that elements. Uh, we thought that in a green infrastructure, of course, there should be present the natural elements. Most of them were, right? Um, these natural elements were uh, retrieved from Foursquare. And uh, as well, what we call the hotspot facilities, uh, the hotspot Pot facilities were the attractors, right? Other types of activities developed in the open space that can attract people to use the green areas. And then the connectors, right? Uh, even when the connectors are uh, represented with circles in the case of some of the most popular plazas in the historic center of Valencia, the connectors are as well the lines uh, of uh, specific avenues, streets, and, and trails that connect uh, like the green elements with the attractors and uh, among other among each other. So in this case, uh, what we discovered is that if that information from social networks uh, was had um, considered at the time of doing this planning, a 64% of urban spaces and uh, places of attraction would have been incorporated in that uh, green infrastructure because people uh, can use uh, the main green spaces of the city, but mainly they use the green spaces that they have uh, near their homes. So all that pocket part, parks, and maybe we can say it better here, the pocket parks and the plazas and the places where the people during their everyday lives uh, gather and spend time in the outdoors were missing in that uh, planning, right? Um, here we have the opportunity to collaborate with um, some European, uh, so, sorry, with the um, Chamber of Commerce, uh, which is called here in Spain. Uh, because they have uh, like European funding to um, make a regeneration of a vulnerable area here in Alicante, which is called Las Cigarreras. And in this area, which is in the map, uh, you can see in orange the dots of um, economic activity, uh, land uses from Google Maps. And uh, in red, we have like the main attraction uh, hotspots and uh, the, the, let's say the relevance of that hotspots is uh, in that uh, uh, blue circles, like the size of the, the greater the, the size of the circle again, it's the most popular um, and attractive uh, places. So, uh, with several maps of this type, we realized different things. But the point here is, for example, in the area marked as number one, we can see that there are few uh, land uses, few economic activities in that area, which is an historic urban pattern, which was out of the walls of the traditional city of uh, Alicante. And in this case, if we check the information from Airbnb, 
we see that on number one, we have plenty of lodging and plenty of um, hostels and hotels in that area number one. So facts as these ones, uh, let's say that make us think of the area differently and try to boost the relationships between the different types of activity and the different types of uh, trails. So the plan was, uh, even when we already in this part of the city, we have those main itineraries where uh, people uh, walk and this place with, let's say it's the, they are the blue um, streets and avenues. Uh, we proposed to make an investment in all that orange and pinkish uh, itineraries that could boost activity in other areas of the city. Uh, nowadays, those, those streets are streets that have plenty of parking space, uh, that they are not really, uh, let's say, attractive in their image. Um, there are really few commercial um, uses open, but they could make some plans or give some investment to provide more activity in that trails so that the city and that specific neighborhood could reactivate in a sense. This is one better picture of that because this is an area that, you know, has like the bull ring, uh, um, plenty of plazas and places where people can gather, but uh, people, um, I mean, even when there was an, uh, an everyday life, uh, the spaces and the urban places where it is held, they were not, they don't, they still do not have the right quality to um, thrive with that urban vitality. And can, this you, is like, can you stop for a second? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so if you go back, um, there's a, you know, this one, yeah, or the other one, you propose it in work. So what is quite interesting here, um, seen from the perspective of complex systems, right, is um, this is very equivalent to adding or removing a street somewhere where there's a lot of like nonlinear effects, right? So you can take out streets and speed up the traffic and put streets in and make stuff uh, sort of weird. So the question is like, like, let's assume I'm the mayor of the city and uh, you you walk along and you say, look, we need to invest in these other orange streets, which basically doubles the amount of economic space, which obviously, you know, everybody buys a pair of shoes, not two pairs of shoes. And, uh, you know, you buy bread in one bakery, not the other. So, so there is obviously some kind of interest in the bakeries on the now blue streets to not lose business to new bakeries in the orange street, for example. So is there, um, did you think about strategies to sort of like think about uh, places where these kind of topologies that you are suggesting already are in existence? And I'm concretely thinking about Madrid where there is certain places, like if you speed up, you're moving with, um, you know, I don't know, bicycle or skates or whatever, you can you can actually see there is places which are like this thing you suggest. There's places which are more grid-like. They look like more like Manhattan, even though they're not really rectangular. But you basically have plenty of bakeries in, in a grid. And then there is moments when you sort of like default to the main um, sort of road that is sort of like, you know, the central axis through the city. And it's really hard. You have to sort of consciously sway away from that place but then it's boring so now this kind of thing is is obviously not just the built environment but what you're suggesting here is really that the behavior of the people should change and that is that is a quite that's a quite daunting challenge isn't it <laughs> yes well i have to say that maybe i didn't insist that uh, what we unveiled with the social network data in that case is, is that along that orange and um, pinkish uh, mm -hmm. streets, there were um, already uh, some of, I mean, they were selected because they were 
the streets that had already a uh, life and activity mm -hmm. but they were not uh, they 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 don't still have the proper urban quality to make them thrive as the places that they they should be i mean okay, i should, okay, yeah. I should <laughs> maybe have have come with a photograph I, I agree with you in that because i mean they are the types of of streets where you have a bakery, I mean, um, a, a bakery that remains there against all odds because you know that nowadays the retail uh, in, on ground floors uh, is having uh, a lot of struggle with uh, maintaining their levels. And in these areas and in these streets, uh, maybe there are a lot of lots of traffic, uh, really narrow sidewalks, and maybe they could contemplate a refurbishment to uh, gain that protagonism that they should have. Mm -hmm. uh, all these itineraries were as well uh, traced and thought, considering that they are like the most direct uh, connection between cultural assets and cultural places or shopping centers or connecting little plazas with activity. Because sometimes, uh, for example, uh, this line, this blue line, mm -hmm. is like the one uh, attracting all the activity or the main activity um, in this area. But it is true that all the people living here could have like the pocket spaces or uh, places that are um, near their houses and they do not really need to get to there to have some have something or have or or even um, just like gather with people so that was like the the main aim of the strategy i mean it uh, the purpose was like to if the town hall has to make some investment in the area uh, in which places it would be uh, suitable to start uh, where are the places? Uh, because we know that sometimes and, and nowadays we have funding to make things and we have uh, here in Alicante, for example, we have the this sense that uh, that uh, all the time we are investing in the places that are touristic or in the main plazas or in the main avenues and not in all the neighborhoods that maybe are in need of that investment just to provide like neighborhood life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Oh, Mark Hanid raised the hand. Okay. okay. Mark. It's muted. Yeah, um, Mark, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, you, you, you partially um, answer um, what I wanted to ask, but um, yeah, like, but here the these these streets are anyway kind of central, no? Um, you you were saying that yeah, investing, but at the end it's all like quite uh, central um to the cities, and and it's not the periphery that maybe is more. Yeah, um, I'm glad to say that. Yeah, well, indeed. Um, let me check because, well, I, I, I will have. I, I have. A, uh, I can go farther because I have some. Uh, maybe this is this is a much better. I, I mean, and I also wanted to mention, like me coming from Barcelona, um, like Ada con Lauda did this uh, super islands and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it did transform these streets were actually make pedestrian, but um, some people like it, some other no. Then then in terms of, of uh, for example, real estate, the streets that became pedestrian, um, uh, like, I don't know, boost the price of the real estate, uh, which in Barcelona as you know is is a is a huge problem for for especially especially among young people and, and and actually locals because recently the ones who buy the properties in in the city they are um mostly foreigners <laughs> rich foreigners especially in la champla and, and where, where they actually intervene 
uh, means, yeah, I mean, this kind of, um, uh, it, it's nice to have pedestrian uh, areas, but when you actually affect the price of the houses up, and then and then locals are even more harder to buy um, anything there, um, then, 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 yeah, I mean, then it's an impact that is also uh, taking away the people um, from the city to to the to the outskirts of, of, of Barcelona. Where well, actually, I'm born in the outskirts of Barcelona, but basically, um, everyone is in the in the outskirts even more, and 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 pressing the outskirts of the city because the people cannot buy and not not only buy rent in in the city, then they can they they try to rent outside of the city, but even the outside of the city is is uh, is is present. Uh, and and then the the new the new outside the city is even farther away. It means anyway, just to say that yeah yeah this 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 kind of um is kind of a cascade uh, effect what what you do in one street, but then 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 maybe you make nicer this street, but then you you get out the people from this street to live in another place because they cannot afford um, uh, rent or 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 buying or or live. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for the question. I think uh, uh, well Alicante. Uh, historic city center is like here. This is a piece of a traditional urban pattern, but it is not considered as historic center. That's why I think that Airbnbs have uh, colonized all this area. And the commercial and central areas are located like here, uh, um, near oh. the port. These areas were built like in the uh, mid 90s, uh, mid, um, like in the 70s of uh, the past century. And the idea is not, I mean, it's not focused on the pedestrianization of that uh, orange lines. Uh, it is more um, on uh, giving, uh, providing urban quality because. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is not uh, building a um, super block. I know, I, I know the problematic in, in Barcelona. Um, for example, here in Alicante, I think we are more concerned about um, the increasing number of um, Airbnbs or these short-term accommodation uh, types because we don't have a plan and seeing what you have suffered in these terms, we are more concerned about that than uh, in the in a way in, in making super blocks. Because as I said, that traffic in the, and I'm getting back to um, that slide, uh, the traffic um, in this area is not, I mean, is not, there's not a lot of traffic. The traffic is more or less condensed on the blue lines. But the thing is that in that orange uh, streets, you can make like neighborhood life. Mm. And if there are not um, adequate spaces uh, or adequate activities, this is, I mean, this is not, uh, for example, um, that uh, line, it's not more than uh, 300 uh, meters length or, I mean, it is a it is an urban pattern that it's not that that it's really walkable and people is not walking because they do not have um, an interesting trail or an interesting image of the city. These neighborhoods were uh, built with certain um, um, with with um, were built really fast. Because, you know, it was that moment of the migration of people from the uh, villages to the town. And then uh, the construction is not really good um, as, uh, and, and neither uh, the streets or the plazas. So that was a way more than restructuring with that strategy of the urban blocks or with uh, the purpose of uh, like uh, making the prices uh, increase uh, just to provide like better spaces for the people in that uh, areas. There's a, a like one interesting thing like we're rotating around in this discussion is right is is that you take information from the city like a trace data and then you do an intervention like you do a diagnosis ideally an intervention and then there is new trace data and the question is like how does it change so. 
you know, people use agent-based models and all sorts of kind of stuff in order to sort of like model this. But one of the interesting things is, in addition to sort of all the fancy new data, there's a bunch of things which sort of like stare us in the eye. Like if you look at this picture and we look at the central blue axis, the housing to the, the houses to the right are much, much more big blocks um, sort of uniform on the outside while left of the middle blue axis, there's a lot of like, you know, smaller, intricate, uh, noisy structure going on. And so one question I would like to add to this whole discussion is like, how do you see sort of like these kind of like infrastructure that sort of like is just there where you can reuse certain things? Like, you know, the variety on the left is sort of easier to harness for sort of interesting life than the uniformness on the on the right, for example, right? So there's like, how do how do you deal with that? Like, you know, it's it's one thing to draw a line on a map, and then on the other hand, like if we if we would stand in these streets, there is something completely different going on. Like, like you know, what would a chain Jacob standing on the left of the blue middle road, and a chain Jacob standing on the right of the middle road, sort of suggest? In your in your case, like like what what would be the interventions that you would actually do in this particular case? As you say, stuff is going on. So, but Airbnb is happening, business is happening, but nobody's walking. Like like, how could you actually, um, like, what would be the solution? Like opening ice cream parlors or 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 putting benches on the street or like what would be the solutions for these both sides, for example? Yeah, the thing is that um, I think that we, when we design the city, we design tangible things. We cannot yes. change the behavior of people, as as uh, you raised before. And the thing is that, um, in my experience, if you design pl flexible places where people can do as many things as possible, mm -hmm. you are trying to, as as Sandra and Senet said, right, uh, like. Uh, trying to design the disorder mm -hmm. but uh, we are not um saying the people what they have to do or what they are going to do but um intervening in that uh, orange uh, streets by providing with uh, wider sidewalks or as you said uh, benches or places to gather or um less parking lots because they are uh, that streets are streets uh, full of parking space uh i mean all the facades are gray and the architecture is not uh, is really ordinary it is not so if you give them some uh, landmarks some places to do different uh, activities like gathering or or playing or playgrounds for the children, because these are residential areas where um, there are quite a lot of uh, children. So uh, if you provide with uh, that flexible urban spaces that are far beyond only parking lots and traffic, I think that they could provide with greater uh, life, neighborhood life, let's say. That's, that's like the... Um, like the aim of the of the idea that mm -hmm. um, selecting that trails or that streets that could uh, enhance like the life of that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Can you go back two slides? Like sure. A further. Okay. Yeah, this one. No, that one. This was one. Really good. Yeah. yeah. So what what you show what you what you're telling is is a really interesting thing, right? Like you, you you and I, I'm fully with you because obviously I've been to places too. Um, there is these different neighborhoods, right? It's built in the '70s, built in the '60s, built in the '90s, reused, um, built in the 19th century, and stuff like that. There's very different sort of like notions going on. People use playgrounds, small playgrounds that are very heavily used, large playgrounds that don't work at all, and stuff like that. So. All these kind of things are quite interesting, while at the same time, we started out with digital trace data. And so if one squints, you can actually see there is a difference between the y, between area six, area one, and area two. I would say there is a different dithering of dots going on, right? So, so the, the density of the red dots in, in the bottom of six is different 
from number one, and number one is also different from number two, but it's really subtle. And if somebody would do sort of like statistical, I don't know, uh, measure the entropy or regressions, whatever, of distances of dots, then, you know, that it would be really hard to put a finger on, even though as you walk through these neighborhoods, you can totally spot and characterize and describe the difference. So the question here is, in how much is what you do informed by this digital trace data and how much of the diagnosis, how much of the intervention you do actually then emerges from looking closer at the actual world in a, in a qualitative way. Like in other words, how, how much percent would the digital trace data feed into like what you're actually doing? Because what you're doing is really classic urban planning. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can give you an anecdote that maybe shed light on, <laughs> on this matter. The thing is that, of course, we know the city and of course we have a um, like, um, predominant idea uh, prior to make our intervention. But for example, we were finding along that trails, along that streets that we decided to draw in orange, that there were gathering spaces that we didn't really know. For example, oh. in, in this area here, there are like uh, some little stairs because this is uh, uh, the top of a hill of a yeah of a hill uh, with uh, plenty of sport and educational spaces. And in the stairs like give access to that um, urban facilities. Um, there were like popular names that were repeated in the texts of uh, different social networks. I mean, in Foursquare, that they, they were recognized as uh, las escaleritas. I mean, like a, um, like a, let's say, um, a funny name for a place where people could gather. And the same happened with different crossings where they said like, uh, these places uh, where we gather together. So um, it was a way of, uh, I mean, that information was unveiled only because we had that data sets that gave us that information. Maybe uh, it's the place to gather for uh, some students going to one of the high schools in, in area seven or uh, for some uh, neighbors uh, living uh, in area three, but it was relevant enough for us uh, for understanding that some dynamics and some gathering places were being recognized by users of that social networks and they were placed in, in that street and not in the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And seeing that that street uh, then connected like relevant urban facilities was like the last uh, punch that we needed to draw the line. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even when we think that um, we are doing urban, uh, like, as you said, traditional urban planning, uh, these data can provide like additional information uh, that we cannot know otherwise. Thank you very much. I think this is a really excellent example for um, actually, we had discussions, Xenia and I, here uh, about with people from Sitesmap, who, which was a database, yeah. uh, like a, a map where you could actually spot where people do more dense uh, tourist photos than other places, basically. And one of the interesting things that I found that was always so fascinating about this application is that it really lends itself to this kind of spare fishing, right? Like there is this kind of things where you, there is, there's things you learn only on a map like this. So it's the quantitative result. You could even say it's a, it's a computer science paper cutting short uh, the whole modeling game, right? So, so there is no algorithm, there is no, there is no um, model of urban activity. There is no, uh, you know, no, no, no global model, but, but the resulting map is, is just unbelievably valuable for somebody who has a very particular interest in this particular case, these three staircases, which or four, which which are just fascinating places. You know, this is like if you emphasize this, like if 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 people are not aware, like if the city is not aware, they may 
you know, out of ignorance, put something there so people don't meet anymore. And if they realize, oh, it's a meeting place, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe a musical revolution happens because two people who met in high school on that staircase um, invent a new musical instrument. So you, you never know, right? Like, I mean, this is sort of like a, an example, which is sort of only halfway made up because in New York, stuff like that happened, right? And so this is sort of something which I find quite curious, which I think is in general a problem, which we should probably discuss during this two hours, which is on the one hand, there is people who do these maps for the first time, right? Like the, the Foursquare map was just a map, but there was plenty of research happening at the same time from Sensible City Lab, MIT Media Lab, um, you know, places in Europe where people model like pedestrian dynamics and stuff like that. People got tenure with that and so on. But and now if you do the same thing that people have done 10 years ago, people say, oh, that's not new. People did it 10 years ago. Or it's like, yeah, but the data is new. It's, it, it's a different map. There's different details that are interesting. And it's just like, you know, nobody says like, oh, you're just playing the guitar. People already did that 50 years ago. I mean, right? So th there is this new sort of quality, which is in the detail. And that's the reason we need to do that. And it's, it seems like you are applying and you made this case. You said like, I'm applying to specifically, not globally, but to specific places, specific city in, in cities in Spain which I think is a really, really great achievement because that is sort of something that needs to be done. But then here's the challenge. Like, how do we actually, beyond the three staircases, which is your example, or some other example, which I may make up, or some other example, which, you know, somebody else may make up. Um, how do we actually serialize that? How, how can people sort of all get access to this kind of decision mapping? How can we go beyond Google Maps and give people the sort of luxury of looking at densities, layers, and so on, which, which in the US citydata.com does do for you, but not with these kind of that granular detail. But in most places on earth, this doesn't happen. Like this map, you have to be at the university to produce it. It's not like somebody can just say, oh, I'm interested in this city, and you just open it, and um, then this kind of data is, is coming at you, while there is places where people earn money um, that have that data, which we give them for free, you know, to Facebook, to <laughs> all these companies, all these platforms, where they can totally look at that kind of data. They can make algorithmic decisions of like, you know, where to place the advertising. So, so how do we how do we deal with that? Like, how do we produce what you what we can see here, but for everybody for their specific place, like what is happening where in the neighborhood, what is happening in the city, and so on. I'm afraid I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because as I said, uh, when we started doing all of this, uh, the application programming interfaces were quite open and they offered mm -hmm. uh, quite unrestricted data. But that's not what happened nowadays. You need to pay for the data or the conditions are so restricted that you need to have a software machine uh, during all the time querying the API to get a um, sufficient amount of data uh, to make something, uh, as you said, like in a, in, a, in a little area. We don't have um, data of a whole city whenever we want it and, 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 and the amount that we need or, or on the type that we need. And I think that's going to be difficult. Um, in the in 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 the following uh, years, unless any policies uh, make compulsory to share uh, that data or or something like that, mm -hmm. but I I agree with you in that um, planning would be easier or it would be desirable that we could uh, have access to all that data uh, generated by people that that can let us know many things in cities that even with, as I said, even with traditional methods, we could not know. Uh, the next case that I had prepared uh, maybe illustrates this a little bit. Um, uh, Mar, Mar had a question maybe okay. before you go. Mar? Well, I, 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 very interesting this thing of the, of the Airbnbs. And I, I was just like thinking if you, you try to, um, 
to kind of compare or something with with the rent rent uh places like um well I know in in, in Spain most of the time Cidalista is the the one who has more advertisements yeah uh, if you if you try it anything to kind of to see um if if it has some kind of like relation the number of density of um yeah. of Airbnbs and the and the lack of rent on 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 this area because it will be very interesting um i, I can see for the number of dots that uh correct me if i'm wrong is alicante still allowing uh quite easy to make Airbnbs for normal yes, yes. It is, but, it but is what easy. i can see here because uh it, it's not not the case now anymore in catalonia in general yeah um, i know i know i'm aware of that planning in in, in catalonia the thing is that uh, here in alicante as i said before uh, the matter is still unregulated and we yeah. are uh, running down a hill without brakes on that matter and no regulation is still um um uh, presented in in this case in alicante so that's that's the thing and for sure uh, all the red dots that you can see it's because uh the um, the homes or the properties of airbnb are overlapping i am sure that nowadays because this uh work was made like in 2018 oh. uh, i am sure that the red is now uh, more <laughs> intense and and there are lots many many more uh, points in the in that picture. I I am sure that that uh, is uh, happening. Uh, I have not myself working with Idealista or these other uh, portals of data on uh, dwelling prices and so on. But some colleagues are, and maybe if you're interested, I can uh, send you some publications on the matter. No, I just I mean it's so not my area. Work on that. Oh, oh. Yeah. Of a study, but then just like uh, I was, I mean, it's just like an intuition that um, that it, it, there is some kind of relation to this like massification of uh, Airbnb and and lack of um, of rent and 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 also especially probably in in the in the worst neighborhoods where the rent is low, more more kind of like uh incentive to kind of put airbnbs to kind of like get more profit out of that right yeah yeah um maybe even center center might be that because the rent is higher um you still can uh, don't get the disadvantage of like having to clean the apartment and maybe get something broke um and then you put you put like uh basically yeah tourists yeah, I mean, no, it just was a comment because, like, for me, it seems a, a, a very nice step that you, you could do in here to kind of analyze with the rents. Okay. Okay, nice. Then uh, maybe I can show you the next one, which is uh, not similar because then here we are uh, stepping out of the urban uh, to a natural landscape. And here uh, is the case that the Santa Pola Town Hall, uh, which is a little village uh, in the coast, asked us as a university, as, as a group, uh, to provide, like, um, to plan um, some regulation on the uses, land uses, on this area, which is uh, the Santa Pola Cape, which is a natural area, which is uh, partially protected. Uh, and uh, well, the the initial idea was that um, they have a problem, and it is that in the summer, this area that you see in the picture, for example, this area of parking, that parking lot, is not enough for all the people that get there and want to enjoy the sea and uh, the climate and so on. And all that uh, road that you can see is crowded, full of traffic. Uh, the people is everywhere, walking all around and um, erasing all the natural value of that uh, area. So the plan was to make restrictions on where people can walk, 
where traffic can go and so on. And all the information that we had in that case was that people from the town hall said, yes, people use this area, uh, they walk around, and but we don't exactly know where uh, they would be doing that activity. Like they go hiking, they go um, uh, surfing and so on. So what they wanted was like a plan of restriction of uses and permission of doing some of that uses, uh, but at specific spaces. So here really quickly, uh, like analyzing the places, the land uses, the tangible spaces, but as well by using Wikiloc, we unveiled that where people, uh, the trails that people used, really used for hiking are marked, as you can see, in pinkish and purple tones. And then with that perspective where, yes, you can see barely like footprint uh, in the mountain, we were sure that what they needed were some trails uh, where they could um, use uh, this natural area and then leave alone the rest of the green areas just uh, for the regeneration and for the life of the natural species. So the idea was to, apart from that trails uh, that were unveiled from Wikiloc, we decided to uh, reconstruct like four itineraries, the one on the coast that which is the current road of the coast, but uh, one for a pedestrian and cycling access, and then another two, one which is this one, which, is, which would be a panoramic uh, trail, and then another one on the top of the Cape, just to have uh, the better views. So the idea is that, as I said before, sometimes we use like traditional planning, but that evidence from uh, the virtual footprints that users are leaving uh, in the networks, we can unveil where uh, they are making that uses and uh, how can we intervene like easily, just maintaining the activities that are currently being developed. And finally, um, the presentation, um, I would like to end with what are we currently working on? Because some years ago, we were uh, like reflecting about what we, we called uh, this uh, something as revisiting the definition of the boundaries of the neighborhoods. And I think still that we should have entitled the work uh, differently because it was not about mm, the limits, but of uh, the centers, social functionally, uh, what is uh, the center or what gravitates uh, in the different types of areas that we have in the cities. Um, this is Alicante and, and we have uh, 42 uh, administrative neighborhoods. And the thing is that uh, we thought that the delimitation or the form of that neighborhood doesn't really respond to the functional and social perception of the areas. And by using Google Maps uh, information, we were trying to figure out if we could delimit a, a more accurate neighborhoods that could be used uh, for further planning. Uh, in this case, we were tackling with Voronoi polygons and some clustering calculation. And we were happy that we found out that clustering all that information, what we realized is that in the middle, I mean, that the, um, that the access with the high concentration of economic activity with that calculations were central areas in that new clusters, well, like we call them functional clusters, right? And they are not in the limits of the neighborhoods as it happens today. This was relevant for us because we were thinking if we were to plan uh, for a specific neighborhood, 
the main or the most relevant activity is remaining at the boundaries of that administrative neighborhood. What if we consider that access as the key spaces of um, that uh, neighborhood? And we really started working with this type of clusters and well, we realized that we got some um, discoveries that were interesting. However, in that time from then uh, up to now, we were inspired by this map, uh, the social, social and functional analysis of Abercrombie and Forshaw for the plan of London in 1943. And um, our idea uh, was, can we do something like that? Uh, just to start understanding our social functional areas in cities in other way, and how can we draw this type of map uh, apart from uh, data from social network? Can we do this or not? So what I'm going to show is just a work in progress that uh, may change in the next uh, few weeks. <laughs> but up to now, um, we have been working with uh, urban morphometrics data. We have been um, working with code that incorporates the measurement of parameter, parameters that come from urban morphometrics, as well as uh, information coming from, as I said, that four square data sets uh, on land uses and preferences on that uses. So um, that code is giving us results that have not yet been plenty of satisfying, but we think we are nearly there. We think we are finding out, uh, this is the case of Valencia, for example, we have uh, like different areas that we recognize because I mean, we are, we are trying to work with cities that we know quite good because uh, it can, we can unveil that this greenish area can be, I mean, functionally be recognized as one or that brownish area uh, as well. We are working as well in the city of Elche and it is curious because these reddish stones correspond to the area of the historic city center. And uh, even when all this area of the city that you can be as a gridded uh, structure uh, has, um, I mean, we could say morphologically, it, this area is really similar, but it is true that there are small spaces uh, that uh, for the concentration of land uses or for the attraction of certain elements in this um, gridded network, they are, uh, recognize or they can be acknowledged as a different social functional area. And finally, we are doing this as I showed you before, this in the city of Alicante, where maybe I can explain better uh, the different areas. Uh, for example, this uh, purplish area, it is like the commercial area with, for, um, by excellence, right? In the, in the city, as well as this is these uh, greenish tones are the historic uh, city center, but maybe in terms of um, dimension of plots, crossings, and so on, this area was also part we can say of the historic first uh, developments, and morphologically they can ha share like a similar pattern. But the truth is that this. Um, Red, uh, pinkish area is uh, full of uh, restaurants, uh, food courts and bars and pubs and places like that. And this area maybe is still uh, a void in that type of activity. So we are, um, I think we are in the path <laughs> of finding out something new, but we have still a long way to go. So any insights on this uh, would be really welcome. And that's the presentation that I prepared, but I am open to your questions, which have demonstrated to be really interesting. 
<laughs> up to now. Thank you very much. So yeah, let's thank the speaker already. So one of the interesting things here is that um, we we, fir we filmed the bus at the 40 minutes. <laughs> So we have 25 yeah. minutes for discussion. Which is far, great. Far. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like your your question, like just uh, at the end. So Mila Oiva has a question, like, but you 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 ask a question uh, if we have anything to add. Like the thing that comes to my mind is uh, Christian Thiemann and Dirk Brockman's plus et al. analysis of the movement of dollar bills in the United States. So there is this thing where people stamp dollar bills with numbers and or with, with, with a website that's called variousgeorge.com. And so we know about the movement of dollar bills across all the United States. And they have actually calculated the transition probabilities between places where these dollar bills are registered. So this is preceding even cell phone uh, analysis. And they could actually find the so-called effective boundaries between states and within states. And so you know, there's one cutting right across the Appalachian Mountains in Pennsylvania, where people in Philadelphia never talk to people in Pittsburgh. But there's other places where, you know, Texas doesn't really have a boundary to Oklahoma and stuff like that. So this these kind of things are, are sort of like um, sort of interesting because you're now we have that kind of data. You have the cell phones and the smartphone data and the trace data, and you could actually do the exact same kind of thing. Like, where do people go? If you live at Street X, where do you go? And one of the key questions though, and this is like sort of something which you sort of in your last example with the restaurants in the middle between these two historic places is, should we really expect the city to bucketize into these regions or is there overlap regions that serve basically multiple regions, like, you know, centers that serve multiple neighborhoods and they shouldn't really be, um, you know, like how do we deal with this thing that you, you can bucketize one way but for example, then, you know, some neighborhood may end up with all the nice stuff, uh, you know, the restaurants that pay a lot of tax and the other neighborhood will not. So how, how do you deal with that? Like there, there's probably, you probably had a lot of discussions with the right people or the wrong people um, to sort of solve these particular problems when you talk about this positive gerrymandering of cities, if you want to call it a name. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I think that the question you raised is uh, totally pertinent. I mean, um, I think that we have only inserted like one layer of information because it's like parameters calculated apart from the types of uses um, and the attraction. But if we uh, um, uh, draw another layer of um, way of functioning in the city, I am sure that that areas are going to overlap and can be, I mean, the city can be characterized by different approaches. And there's not only one that can give us like that uh, ideal planning. Um, that's essentially the beauty of the city, right? The complexity of it. And um, although he, here, um, there have been as well, uh, been doing some type, some of that researches, as you mentioned, the mobility by considering the uh, mobile phone connections and so on. But um, in this case, this last uh, work is based on is is. I mean, we have been doing this um, type of work because uh, we are trying to develop a project uh, in line with uh, the vulnerability and resilience of retail in cities. So the thoughts are, or the main problems now are that uh, in our city, uh, cities and surrounding cities, many ground floor, um, many ground floor uh, buildings are turning into dwellings instead of uh, still being restaurants or other types of shops. And the thing is that um, closing a shop and opening a dwelling is uh, every time um, finishing uh, or with the life of the street. Mm -hmm. So in line with this, uh, our town halls are giving licenses to everybody who is asking to convert a shop into a dwelling. 
but we think they should be um, vigilated or restricted in a way because it is uh, it, it is true that there are streets that have that commercial interest or that areas that are most uh, popular in some type of function, as you said. But um, it is true that we, if we do not uh, try to put a limit or a strategy or a criteria in this conversion, the life in the peripheral neighborhoods, maybe the, the life, and when I say the life is the shopping life, is going to be uh, really, really low or even disappear. So that's that's the, the, the I mean, I, I, I inspired that with, with your comment. Thank you, Mila. Yeah, super interesting. I kind of like, Thank very you. interesting and, and kind of like uh, thought provoking um, presentation. Thank you so much. Um, well, I, I wanted to ask because we all of course know that um, like social media users are often of particular type of, I don't know, urban educated, younger generations and so on. Uh, and in the, I, I assume that in city planning, there are also questions related to how to plan uh, safe and nice um, areas for children and, and attractive areas for, for uh, families with children or or kind of like take into account elderly people or people with wheelchairs and you know you know these you know different types of uh, of people. So I, I have you been thinking about what how could we use or are there certain types of um, like social media data that would lend themselves lend, lend themselves to analyze these. Um, these types of uses, uh, are there certain kinds of like data points or or um, or would, I, I really like the way you kind of like use these different layers. Uh, so would it be one, one of the options to kind of like smartly, I don't know, combine different types of data so that we could also learn about different um, kind of city, city dwellers and, and city users. Um, you know, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your comment. I think that, uh, I mean, it is difficult that, for example, we can monitor children uh, with this uh, type of data, right? But um, we have been analyzing this type of data like 10 years, like for 10 years. And the truth is that when we started, many of our elder people uh, didn't really, um, and grab a phone and get to walk or, or something like that. But the truth is, um, as time goes by, <laughs> people, elder people have a phone, right? Uh, I mean, our parents and even grandparents have a phone and they take it with them when, when they go and they don't use the social networks. But, I, but as I said, um, that devices are monitoring their activity and I'm sure that we will get to that data sooner or later and the difficulty is in for example monitoring uh, children but um, I don't know if that's a problem we 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 are trying to uh, design the city for everybody and if we find evidences on some groups the truth is that we are incorporating their interests or their the places that are relevant for them in planning um up to now that's enough i mean that's a, a, a pro we have progressed on that uh, respect to some years ago so i think that um this is not an end of a path uh, and on the contrary i mean this is uh, uh, as I said, this is work in progress. We are all the time discovering things, things that are um, really working for us in our current designs or current works. And there are things that couldn't be done anymore because data stops um, being accessible or it changes or it changes the way the metadata is uh, available and so on. So. Um, there is still a long way to go and, and and many discoveries to make in that sense. I don't know if I answered your 
<laughs> concerns. Yeah, yeah, sure. I have a, a follow-up question. So one of the big issues is like, like, you know, sort of it's all exciting what we're doing here, right? So we, we analyze the city at a scale that we couldn't do before, but now we can. And, um, you know, obviously the situation changes because certain people own that data and they want to sort of monetize it and stuff like that. But then the question is, what are the long-term consequences? Like, you know, and there we're in a much longer sort of trajectory. There, if you visited a Spanish city in, I don't know, 1400, uh, you may have had a really shitty map. And then in 1550, you got a really sort of like cool sort of like overview where you know, oh, this there, where this th thing sticks out, there's the church and over there, there is like this and that palace and that and that cardinal, whatever. And, you know, these things get better and better and better. And at some point you get like maps where you, you, you can't even have disputes about like who owns the fence and the hedge and stuff like that around 18 something maybe. Um, and now we're at this moment where we even have a map of the activity, but that obviously feeds back, like having a map sort of, you know, in the past, you couldn't even, you know, debate like, you know, which millimeter of the fence is yours. Well, if you have the Catasta map and both have signed I on this, I on that, and like sort of the else that administration looks over that, that is completely different. And so what what I'm what I'm getting to here is sort of the long-term effects. Like there is like if 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 you say a neighborhood has been built in the 60s, 70s in Spain, there's a certain ideology behind who built that. The same is true if it was built in the 1990s, the same is true if it was built right now, the same is true. For things where, you know, if you pick a pick a neighborhood like Trastevere in Rome, which is sort of like this mythological sort of wild place where, you know, flats were a bit cheaper and stuff like that. So wild things happened in the 60s. And then Americans bought the places in the 80s and 90s. And sort of it was already sort of a disnification of what happened in the 60s and 70s. But now actually due to basically it being fully Airbnb, it's a disnification of the disnification. So is it, it's not even owned by the Americans, it's owned by, by, by people who sort of rent it out in Airbnb and sell the sort of product of like, look, this is like, you can be the person who owned a flat in Trastevere in 1995. But there is this kind of thing that the whole place changed, even though formally it's the same place. If you know where to go, you can still go to that bar where the locals hang out, but you, you're, you're flooded by people who are not, that process, a completely different process, which again, you can actually document and love for what it is. Like there, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not making a value judgment of tourists being in a place in too high a concentration. A lot of people are having a good time there, but what is clearly the case is that analyzing it, documenting it in tourist guides, in documentary movies, in uh, advertising, in social media, has an effect that changes the place itself. And what you are doing here, or what we are doing here, is we change the world by the kind of analysis we're doing. And the question is, is that a good thing? Like, like how do we really get to the, like, should we have a sort of ethics and a theory of where we want the place to go? And then do we have the power to do so? And should we also take into account the people who definitely have the power to do so? Like, you know, sort of changing the algorithm of like what kind of restaurant swims up on Google, for example, or swims up on Instagram. Like they have power to change the world there, but maybe their intent is not ethical. Maybe their intent is, you know, if you're lucky, they want to just want to earn money. If you're unlucky, they want to make one place not as good as another, for example. Like, like how, do we, how do we deal with this sort of like dimension of what is our effect? Like, like, are we, have we left the kind of phase of urban planning where, you know, if, if you think about it, there was a genius age where, you know, sort of like, like Lake Corbusier would do the big thing and obviously it wouldn't work. And then people, Team 10 in the 1960s would actually say, hey, actually, uh, we need to look at what people are doing. And then people started to measure like Doxiadis with computers. And now we arrive in this thing where we have super granular analysis, but there is still this sort of like asymmetry, like, you know, like what, like, like how, how do we, what is our role in that process? Like, like how can we 
Like, like how do you see that? Is it the good old urban planning kind of thing where I says like, I'm going to regulate and then people do whatever they want. <laughs> um, yeah. and then I regulate some more. Or is it, is, is there like, 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 how does this change? Like, like what you do obviously changes what your department is doing. Yeah. How, what does it do? I, I think I think that I, that I understand your 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 point. Uh, the thing is that um, if we are thinking in the long term effects, I think that we already are in that in the middle of that long term effects because um, our, in our reality we are suffering of that Instagramable buildings or places or landmarks in our cities and suddenly uh, out of nothing uh, one bakery that was not known uh, generates a flow of people in a street that was um, empty all, all, all the year long right so uh, I think that it is difficult that we can uh, manage these effects as I said before all of us we when we visit a new place a new city we check uh, the Google Maps or, or the wherever and check for the best rated restaurant or uh, wherever uh, and, and we want to, as you said, with the Airbnb, some of our uh, works on Airbnb, we realize that there's Airbnb where dwelling, where there is dwelling or there are dwelling, right? Uh, if you have a house, it is uh, possible that it turns to an Airbnb because here, for example, in Alicante, all the coast is a really touristic area and we have uh, Airbnbs uh, from the most accessible uh, dwellings in the historic city centers to the most inaccessible places in, 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 in the mountains or whatever, right? So I think that in that case, there should be a regulation because um, city is otherwise it's not going to be um, city anymore. Everything is subject to be touristic and many of uh, our areas are going to be gentrified. As you said, gentrification is, is um, a real problem in our cities currently. So I don't. I, I think that, um, for example, in that case of Airbnb, it, it can be, in a in a way, uh, restricted. But the thing is that I see difficult that we can restrict the Instagramable space or the top rated restaurant. It has always existed in a way because you know we have that. Michelin guide or that uh, ranking of the best whatever in the world and we all want to go or we'll have the curiosity of checking on that ranking or on that list but the thing is that um, this has been like democratized in a sense because we have it uh, on the palm of our hand so um, I think it is it is difficult and that when we plan as I said before, we, we can plan the tangible or some of the things we can uh, try to generate some dynamics or uh, like try to balance attraction from one place to another, creating new attractions as we have uh, done all the time or trying to enhance uh, a trend or a flow or something like that. But um, it is, um, I think that, that it is difficult to manage uh, with the power of uh, the attraction of the social networks over physical places. Mars. Um, very interesting. I, I just was, one curious question was about um, if, if all these studies that you did, um, the kind of local politicians they they kind of look when they i don't know they do some planning on on the cities and uh of alicante and valencia the, the well the, the places that you you, you had uh, shown i mean because some uh, sometimes i i feel that they they don't look uh the expert knowledge on on this um and and i think that you you had 
uh, some some very interesting uh, topics. I mean, I see a lot of like ideas and opportunities. I see, especially when you combine different layers that 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 you can um, that you can analyze uh, on it because. Uh, also the the Airbnb and the tourists in general, I think that no one had done a, a proper impact on 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 in Spain what tourists is, is happen like how much impact has in the cities tourists in general. Um I mean I, I saw a documentary of, of Benidorm recently and, and a sociologist was talking about this that um I mean Actually, in in opposite, you are saying that they have very negative views on on Benidorm, but he he opposite he thinks that um, uh, tourists also bring into the city. But I mean, in in general, I feel that the the tourism is is so massive in in Spain that um, we we need to study more and 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 to kind of like have a, a, a balance on on how to how to do it properly. It's it's not just to take it out the tourism, it's just like to to kind of like to to have a, a more like direction and, and and kind of uh, uh how to do it with with a sense i, I mean i think um, and and i know yeah. that some cities they leave from this means they also needs to be um yeah uh thought on on, on kind of making yeah it's very interesting what you said because we usually say that we can have one benidorm but not every municipality on the coast can be benidorm right <laughs> because yeah. benidorm is the the um, the massive uh, tourism uh, locality by excellence, by excellence uh, in the Mediterranean coast. Uh, it has a model of a sustainable occupation because it's a city uh, with uh, plenty of towers and the model of uh, development is really uh, consuming uh, low space. But the thing is that it attracts a great volume of uh, tourism and I think that that's not um, bad I mean that's uh, a city dedicated to tourism it is uh, the tourism industry itself and the city um, planning uh, operates to enhance that activity because everybody there or mostly everyone works around uh, that activity but uh, the thing is uh, or, or I think that the main problem is uh, how can we uh, manage tourism in a conventional city? Because we have, of course, a cultural attraction or, I mean, you, the curiosity of um, uh, reaching a city and having a good time and, and so on. But as we said before, I mean, as long as the neighborhoods and the peripheries are gentrifying, and and the and the um, historic city centers itself they are like turning into thematic parks and that's that's really sad because uh, we are losing their historic value um, mm -hmm. and i don't know if that's uh, recoverable for example i uh, when you visit any medieval city uh, we know we are aware that they were not created for cars they were not created for uh, nowadays life but we need to transform in a way uh, that fragments of the city uh, that uh, need need to be of use for us and uh, not to turn them into thematic parks that are uh, void by night and then uh, fully crowded during the day i don't know if i'm <laughs> if this is the the, the answer you yeah, if I can comment in Barcelona, there is even different things also that I I, I think that for me is in, is is kind of um, difficult because for when Colau was there, always was talking about the um, the life of the neighborhoods. But since I'm from periphery of of Barcelona and a city in uh, in the periphery of Barcelona, they actually were neglecting us like the periphery of Barcelona, that we go to Barcelona to work and we go to Barcelona to 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 do cultural things. And and they were only talking about the neighborhoods. And it's, it's, it's even that though that um I'm an artist and and they are not allowing us to apply the periphery to the Barcelona thing because we are non-metropolitan area. Like my city is the next one that is non-metropolitan area in theory. 
uh, and 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 they are the capital actually they are the capital of the province they get the money for that and and they are uh, doing the policy against us when everyone of the periphery is actually working in the city uh, and and they were talking about neighborhoods and about the people of the neighborhoods but the people of the neighborhoods are actually in most of the cases even like well there was some study recently like that uh, one of three are are um are only locals really like two are are from abroad barcelona um because the the locals had go in the periphery because they cannot pay for the high um incomes um and means means this is a, this is the thing that the, it, it is sometimes this policy making they don't look the whole scope of of the problem i think um i mean especially um, um, in, in this kind of complex cities like like barcelona um yeah i think alicante might be a little bit more easy to manage in certain uh, things yeah it it i mean the size of the city and the complexity of course uh, is an input that can facilitate or not uh, within that complex situations but um, you need to have a purpose. You really, I mean, for planning cities, um, I think that you really need to be focused on uh, who are you planning for, for investment or for population or what's your aim in, in that case. And in relation to, to data, there's something that I didn't say, but it, I, 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 it struck to me when, when you were speaking about this and, and, and it is related to, um the impact of quantitative or qualitative data because it is related to uh, what we know about the city because for example qualitative data is used is of utility for us when we are speaking of a whole city or uh, we want to analyze something which is related to um i mean like in in broad numbers but when we're speaking of a community or finding an evidence uh, that is related to a street or to a neighborhood or, or, or at a lower scale, qualitative data is gaining the battle totally because we don't have that amount of data to make a decision uh, over a city. As you were saying, this is a matter of the periphery. The, this is something related to the qualitative part of the planning or the city. This is not numbers, this is not population, this is not investment. This is um, like putting black on white, what's the relevant matter. If population is, you need to get to the evidence that qualitative data provides to you. Thank you very much. We we have a lot, we have used our two, two hours and this was oh, really? really, really fantastic. <laughs> Um, I would like to like maybe close with a thought, which I, I was thinking about for, for quite some time, actually. So in some sense, in the past, right, cities were planned top down. Like, you know, if you look at the Baroque city, something like Karlsruhe, radial streets, and there's like absolutely no sort of like bottom up kind of uh, process from the population. While right now we're in a situation where we have this kind of data. But still, you know, some people, they're just regular people and they don't think about the urban planning of the things around them. And so in some sense, there is a niche for urban planners, which is a little bit like, I'd like to compare this to like living in a city that really works well. And I lived in some of them, like Rome or Munich, where is is a little bit like performing something like it's like playing a piece of music and if you're never bored then you've done a good performance but that requires a really good instrument so in some sense good urban planners are like the organ builders for all the citizens who then play their city in different ways and obviously ideally different people can play a different song so it's not the same song all the time and that also works for tourists it works for locals it should work for everybody people should be able to earn money they should have have fun. They should be healthy. Nature should have a chance, and also all, all these kind of things. And this is an incredibly complex process. And you taking in this sort of information that uh, sort of like not for the, you know, sort of oh, I want to have another nature paper and like nobody has done Flickr data before, 
but sort of like solving these like particular problems while doing the classic job of an urban planner, I think is, is a really exemplary kind of way of approaching these kind of things, which does not take away the challenge of the whole thing. Speaking of that, uh, next week we will have another Open Lab seminar and we will have Dietmar Offenhuber, which uh, some of you may know uh, is um, a professor of design at Northeastern University, but he has done a lot of work on the urban uh, cities and uh, these kind of patterns. And uh, so there we will continue sort of the discussion, look more into these um, patterns that emerge from people behaving in cities. Um, while at the same time still having this aesthetic design angle, which I think is really, really great. So um, with that, um, I would uh, thank you very much. This was very, very exciting. And um, yeah, I, I, I will continue to be inspired by the work you're doing. This is really excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I was uh, so glad to share our thoughts on these matters. Thank you. Okay, see you bye -bye. soon. Thank you. Bye bye.